Last time I was home, I took this time lapse, that's the looping time lapse with Polaris in the middle of the frame, and I got a bunch of comments about this weird building, which was in the foreground of that time lapse, and it was weird because people were noticing that at night the roof rolled off. So this is actually an observatory, and tonight we get to take a look inside. So welcome to Grand Pines Observatory. Uh, this is the first time that I've been back in here since the new scope got installed, so this is really cool for me to get to see it. But all of this stuff is my dad's, so he is the expert, so I'm going to let him talk and I'm just going to do the filming today. Hello there. Uh, welcome to our observatory. As you can see, it's an 8x10 shed and the roof rolls off and you can see it's, it's basically the same as a garage door. It's garage door track, garage door rollers and it rolls very easily, so you come out, undo two latches, and in about 10 seconds you're under the clear sky, assuming there's no clouds. Okay, the scope and mount are uh, on this pier, which uh, is mounted on concrete, which was poured in a 16-inch sauna tube, and it's down about five feet into the ground, and there's probably eight to 900 pounds of concrete down there, giving us a very solid base. The pier is isolated from the floor. You can't quite see it under this uh, uh, rubberized membrane here, but. Uh, that allows there to be isolation from vibration so you can be walking around on the floor and not have that vibration translated to the pier which would uh, impact the quality of your images. The mount is a Los Mandy Titan mount. It's designed for heavy loads. It's not meant to be a portable mount, although some people actually take these out in the field, which is an incredible feat all by itself. This mount is, is rated to carry between uh, like 90 to 100 pounds of, of telescope and equipment. Uh, and we're pretty close to that with the, this 80 pound scope. Auto guider, camera, and folks are, and things can get right up there. So it's very well matched, the, the mount and the scope weight wise. Okay, you notice this mount is, is uh, at an angle, and the idea behind this mount is to have this axis aligned to the North Celestial Pole. And if that's the case, then as the Earth rotates, or conversely, as you appear to see the sky rotate, across, uh, stars rotate across the sky, you only have to operate the mount in one axis to keep up. If this were an alt azimuth mount, you'd have to be moving in both alt and azimuth to be able to track a star. So you end up tracking in just one axis and not have two, which makes it very simple. The telescope here is a 14 inch uh, Richie Cretian optical design, uh, which contrasts it from a normal telescope that you would be used to seeing a reflector such as this one over here, which is one that I built uh, about 20 years ago that has a 12 and a half inch mirror uh, and it's a standard reflecting telescope, so the mirror is parabolic. So light enters the tube up here, goes down, is returned back up to a small diagonal mirror which directs the light out here where you can put an IP or camera. The primary mirror is parabolic. What sets the uh, RC or Richie Cretian design apart is that the primary mirror and secondary mirror are both hyperbolic mirrors as opposed to being parabolic. What this does is allow the image when it's returned to a focus to be very flat and distortion free. So it has a large advantage with using today's larger cameras where you don't get distortion or coma or aberration at the edges of the field. So light enters the scope at this end of the pier, goes down to the main uh, mirror to bottom, the 14 inch mirror. It's reflected back up to the secondary mirror in this little cage here. And similar to a Cassegrain design, the light then goes back down through a hole in the center of the main mirror and comes to a focus down here. Lights down, up, and back. This scope is an F8 scope, meaning that the focal length is eight times the length of the diameter of the mirror. That provides a very narrow field of view uh, for this size of a, of a telescope. So instead of operating an F8, I put a focal reducer in here, which operates the scope at about F5.9. I use a CCD camera rather than a DSLR because this camera has the ability to cool and reduce the dark uh, current noise that's in the camera. All systems have inherent noise. And uh, this camera can be chilled down somewhere around 40 to 45 degrees below ambient air. So I normally shoot uh, my images at you know, minus 5 degrees or so, somewhere around there, depending on how warm it is that day. And that cuts out a lot of the noise you'll see in the background of your images. No matter how well you have your mount aligned uh, at the North Celestial Pole, there's going to be variations in how your mount operates. It could be wind, it could be uh, uh, lack of having the exact right rate on the, on the motors. It could be a lot of things. So 
to achieve longer exposures without having your images blur because you're not tracking properly, we use what's called an auto guider. And I have a real simple one here. It's just a small refracting telescope with a little CCD camera at the end. Uh, and it operates with software on a PC off to the side. Uh, when you're ready to take an image, you center a guide star uh, on the CCD chip. It then will lock on to that star. If it sees that star drift in any direction, it's going to send a command to the mount to counterman that movement and keep that star directly where it was when you began. Therefore, your image will be right on. Your, your guiding will be dead on in spite of any uh, deviations you may have in your mount guiding or alignment. And that's even like sub-pixel accuracy, right? Yeah, it get you down to where you're, you're uh, guiding at sub-pixel levels. Uh, it's really handy. I mean, most if you get it, your alignment fairly close, you're going to be able to take a one, two, three minute shot without having any problems. If you want to go longer than that, uh, typically you're going to need to auto guide or you're going to have to have a mount that's precisely on. One of the more challenging things I found is to be able to bring the scope to a very sharp focus. Some people have motorized focusers with closed loop control back to some software that will precisely and accurately focus the scope. I don't have such a setup, I have a manual focus. So I use what's called a button off mask, which is a, uh, a mask which will go on the front of the scope and produce a diffraction pattern that will allow me to focus the scope. It provides a very unique pattern uh, of basically two X's and then a vertical line. And as that vertical line intersects the center of those two X's, you're in precise focus. And you may have noticed there are two lights on the wall. One is your standard white light surrounded by a nice cage so you can't uh, touch your head open on the light bulb. And the other is a, a red light which is uh, used most frequently out here because the red light does not impact your uh, night vision. It's much easier on your eyes. So typically when I'm out here, if I have any lights on, they're gonna be red, not white. So there's, uh, there's one more question now before you know we wait for it to get dark. And that's, why is the roof open during the day? Well, the roof, we're not open during broad daylight. We do it now, we're something in the shade. And that's because this thing heats up and we're in a very hot area here in uh, North Carolina where we get lots of days, 95, 98, and it gets warm in here. And what you want to do is when you operate a telescope such as this or any telescope, you want the air around the telescope to be at ambient with the air around you. So uh, we opened up the roof to uh, help cool things off, let the air settle in. It's, it's much attuned to looking down an asphalt road on a hot day where you see the thermals distorting and coming up. Uh, that is something you don't want uh, in, this, in the telescope when you're taking images because that will be magnified immensely. So you want everything to be in ambient air. You notice on the back of the scope here even there are three small fans. And these fans, uh, it can be plugged can be turned on and that helps cool, that pulls air and helps cool the, the mirror down. That mirror is a very thick chunk of glass. And uh, on a day like today where it was, you know, 87 degrees uh, outside and by the time we go to use this, it's going to drop probably uh, 7 or 8 degrees. It takes a while for that glass to cool down. So you have to give us some help by driving some ambient air over that. So we open it up a little bit ahead of time to help things cool down. So now we just have to wait for it to get dark. You bet. Clear night. We're lucky. Except we got a big moon. Can we see the moon yet? Uh, no, it's behind the trees. Three quarter moon tonight. Huh. So as it turns out, that night there was a little bit more haze than we were expecting, which when combined with the really bright moon meant that there was no way we could take any pictures of deep sky objects like galaxies or nebulas. But if we had, they would have looked like these. But even through the haze, we were able to take a time lapse of an asteroid moving across the sky as it made a very close approach to Earth. And that was so cool that I made it into its own video. So if you want to see us hunting this asteroid, uh, click on the card that's up here somewhere or wait until the end of the video and click on it on the end screen. But other than that, thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this uh, look into the observatory and remember to subscribe for more projects and I'm sure in the future more uh, videos from Grand Pines Observatory.